different conflicts of different intensity in Somalia, in northern Mauritania, in northern Mali, in Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea-Bissau, in the Cameroons, in South Sudan, and one can go on and on. And there is a sense in which Africa has always been alive to the question of interference. I will refer these audience, particularly those who are starting to take time and read the 32 odd speeches that were made in the month of May 1963 by the then heads of states and government of independent African states the 32 of them. And there are two speeches that I want to isolate for this presentation. One was by David Dako of Central African Republic. And in thanking Emperor Hale Selassie and Kwame Nkrumah on that day, he said that we must never forget that the colonial power has not left us. We must recognize that he did not go willingly. And if we don't check them, they'll come back again. And what would little Central African Republic do against them? Today, he is right. Today, if we remember the activities of France and how they propped up the regime of Jean Bedel Bokassa, he was right. Today, as the Honorable Minister has, estimated, has indicated, Africa remains the only continent in the world that is referred to in these terms, Anglophone, to mean that we are a sphere of our erstwhile colonizers. About two weeks ago, there was a meeting of the Commonwealth in London, England, and a friend of mine who is an Anglophile sent me the photograph very gleefully, saying this is a meeting of 53 equal states. I told him, no. If it was so, why is it that the leadership of the Commonwealth is hereditary rather than rotational? In other words, in the minds of the British, her former colonies are still under her tutelage. And I want to submit to us that in the minds of what I'll call the conceptual West, they think they have a divine duty to instruct Africans what to do. True. And in the minds of many African leaders, they think that they have a divine duty to accept what they are told. <laughs> that, in my view, is what the Honorable Minister was talking about, the mindset. And this is something that has been examined. We have seen France and its very pernicious presence in Africa. We know what they did in Burkina Faso against Thomas Sankara. We know what they did in Mali or the Sudan against Modibo Keita or against Seko Toure in Guinea. Pernicious to the core. The Portuguese. We know what battles had to be fought in that area. And let me put this very bluntly. When the former leader of, um, of uh, uh, Portugal, Marcelo Caetano, was asked, why can you not allow the colonies to gain independence? This is what he said in substance. As I have examined world history over the years, the following have emerged that the Caucasians have been responsible for, for monumental discoveries in the development of man. So have the Chinese, so have the Arabs. But the Africans have been responsible for nothing. They are only fit as hewers of wood and drawers of water. And I want to submit to you who are present here 
that in the conceptual west and guarded moments or guarded moments that is what they think and that is how they relate to Africa so the whole idea that they will interfere is something that they think is their God-given duty I said there were two speeches in 1963 that I wanted to refer to I refer to David Dako the second one was the speech by Kwame Nukuruma and Kwame provided the solution he did not complain about colonialism he said we must live here with one army with one command we must live here with one currency we must live here with one currency one country i do not know where its capital will be but i suggest leopoldville or bangui other leaders may have their thoughts kwame was right but who listened to him? Several years down the line, and I've said it in my paper, there were coup d'etats which were engineered, there were mutinies which were engineered, and other forms of destabilization. And I want to believe that the person who actually said it very well in the 1980s was the former American president, Ronald Reagan. He said, the United States of America does what is in her best interest. And I agree with him. Does Africa do what is in her best interest? Do African leaders do what is in the best interest of Africa? Interference will be there in very blatant and brazen ways and in subtle ways. I've always asked, until very recently, how many African countries manufactured bullets? Very few. Until very recently, how many African countries, in fact, how many African countries manufacture jet fighters? How many African, African countries are involved in the arms industry? Some of the leading conceptual West countries which pontificate to us about prizes, peace prizes, are the leading manufacturers of landmines. And if you look at their foreign exchange honors, it is the military and security items. So they say with their mouths, what do they not believe in their hearts? In Kiswahili we say, Vita vya panzi furaha ya kunguru. That when the locusts are fighting, it is the joy of the hawk. Because when they kill each other, they get the food easily, dead. It is in the best interest, I dare submit, without fear of contradiction, that they lit in the conceptual West does not want Africa to stabilize, despite their assertion to the, contrary, to the contrary. And you'll see it in every country because conflict is a major industry. Today, you look at South Sudan and the many peace conferences that are being held, but if you ask who supplies the arms, who provides safe heavens, it is the conceptual West. And when I use the term conceptual West, I'm saying, that it extends to countries which are geographically not in the West, like Australia or Canada. So I'm submitting in answer to your question, Joe, that interference is there and it is part to use this old cliche of the neo-colonial project. The neo-colonial project requires that Africa must remain within the sphere of influence of these states. Today, if you look at the United Kingdom, which has left Europe, one would have thought that those are their cousins and that they should sit in comfort with them. You will now see their involvement being de-emphasized in Europe and their interest and appetite growing towards the Commonwealth. Because in the Commonwealth, they are the major domos. They'll tell us what to do. In Europe, they have to grapple with the Germans and the French, and they don't like it. That is the unspoken bit of it. The French also are in Europe, but the Germans are too strong, and they don't like it. So they want to hold Côte d'Ivoire, Gabon, and tell them what to do. I do not know how many of you saw uh, the press conference that was attended by President Macron in France and uh, Nana Ado uh, of, of, of Ghana. And when Nana Ado spoke as an African should, 
you could see the body language of the French president. How dare this man speak this way? In other words, I'm saying that interference is the mother's milk of European economies. But to answer your second question, they have their own recruits who Professor Philip Nimura will be speaking here to use the old vocabulary of those days. They have the people you call their compra de bourgeoisie. You must remember. <laughs> the the compra de bourgeoisie are Africans with black faces, but essentially they are doing the bidding of these powers. They are the ones you'll find them in different spheres. And they will be present, they are in your cabinet, but they are actually representatives of the foreign intelligence agencies of those countries. We know this, if you look at the disclassified papers from the United States, we now know that some of leading cabinet ministers in many African countries were working for the CIA or some Western agencies. So you are sitting in cabinet, and in these days of, of the mobile phone, they are possibly uh, texting their, their masters in Europe and America. So interference is also exacerbated by these comparative bourgeois for their own benefits. And, and it has never changed, Honorable Minister. In the early days of slavery, they gave some of the chiefs mirrors and, and, and alcohol. Today, what they give them are flats in, in Paris or in Dubai. And that is what makes them undermine Africa. The third mode of interference is through institutions. Look at the, the, the competition as it is now. There is a new entrant into the market that is called China. China is very subtle. Many people wrote the obituary of Rwanda in 1994. 20 years down the line, it has been demonstrated that Africans can actually do it. Between 1983 and 1987, I think Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso also demonstrated that it can be done. We saw in Somalia, despite their problem, so my prescription is African unity. Africa must now begin to negotiate initially in terms of blocks, SADC, ECOWAS, East African community, and ultimately as African Union. And lo and behold, we must do it. And I've always said this cliche. We must do it, because if we don't do it, we will be done. Thank you.